So I finally got around to making a video involving my Commodore 128 as I want to explore the broader world of 8-bit computing. After all, a lot of people forget that these were computers and not just gaming machines, and perhaps fittingly, I decided to start off with Commodore's own attempt at making a word processing solution, Magic Desk. And trust me when I say attempt is the right descriptor to use here. Unfortunately, my effort at documenting this utter turd of a product quickly ran into a problem. Magic Desk would error out every time it tried to access the disk drive. This, surprisingly, isn't Magic Desk's fault. It's more that I don't own any real Commodore disk drives. Instead, I only have an SD2 IDC, which is well known for having compatibility issues. Hopefully, I'll get a 1541 or perhaps even a 1571 disk drive at some point, but in the short term, I needed a solution and that solution is a Pi 1541, which is a full disk emulator built out of a Raspberry Pi. I picked this up as a do-it-yourself kit off eBay quite a while ago as I wanted to get more into building my own electronic projects. That being said, however, this video is not what I call an in-depth review about the Pi 1541. It's better described as a highlight reel of failure that I put together for a laugh. So sit back and enjoy the ride as your host N Commander launches himself into a do-it-yourself project. Let's cut to past me who had just finished unpacking everything. Let's do this. I have not done a DIY solder in years, but I do have a soldering station, as you can see there, that I borrowed from Cell. So I'll admit that I wasn't brimming with confidence at the start of this, and it took me a while to really get into a groove, which lasted until I met an old and dreaded enemy. Let's do the resistors. So let me, let me see here. Like I said, the easiest way to be sure of this is just use the multimeter. Because if I don't, I, I'm going to doubt myself like six or seven times. So multimeter to ohms mode. For those who aren't aware, resistors have color coding to represent their value. For some people, myself included, it can be very hard to tell the shades of color apart. I had assumed that using a multimeter to read the ohms value would allay my fears of mixing up components, but well, I'll just throw in this clip to show how successful I was in that. Okay, so I got the resistor color codes pulled up on my laptop. So that is red, red, and brown, but I mean, that second red does not look right, but red is two, two, and then, I guess that's black, not brown, or zero. That's really hard for me to see. But because I'm gonna be paranoid, I'm gonna check it one more time with the meter. I eventually overcame my resistance about resistors and soldered on. After that, things seemed to go smoothly, albeit with the occasional distraction such as when I went to attach the piezo speaker. Here. Oh, here it is. Remove seal after washing. I mean, that's that's what it really says. Remove seal after washing. All right, so that gets peeled off like that. I'm just gonna stick that there because that amuses me. Towards the end of the build, I took a break to set up the Pi 1541 boot image. After that, it didn't take too long before I was ready for the first smoke test. Okay, all right, let's plug that in. And then... Well, the power light's on. That suggests I did something right. Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Um... The buns are actually doing something. If I... Yep, so that one works. That's the back bun. Um, there is a manual that describes how these all work. I don't have it. Let me get the little um, screen and put that on. So uh, at least the basic functionality is working, which really makes me happy. Okay, all right. Unfortunately, despite these first successes, the LCD refused to work 
and it was becoming clear that I hadn't quite gotten this right. After going around in circles for a while, I eventually found the root cause. Okay, so I was going a little crazy about with this, and uh, let me turn this the right side up. And I mentioned how this board has some configuration settings, and what I realized is that you have to do solder these pads to bridge the connections for the LED. Because I was doing a bunch of testing and nothing seemed like it was connected, and then I realized, oh, I have to do this. So what I have to do, if I understand this correctly, is I have to bridge this for the 3 volt 3 or uh, 3.3 volts. Um, I have to bridge the VCC ground, the bottom one here for my LED. And then the these select the I2C bus connector. So um, I'm pretty sure I know the correct settings. I think this has to be this has to be 3.3. I have to make it so it's ground in VCC uh, because apparently some versions of the LCD have it the other way around. And then um, we select the I2C connector. So um, let's, uh, so I've got the iron out. I was just reflowing the pins for my own sandy because I thought these might be cold solder joints. It took me a while, but I managed to solder all the necessary connections. As it turned out, there were two more blocks of bridges that I had to set. After rechecking my work several times, I was ready to reassemble the Pi 1541 and see if anything would explode. That goes back on top. Every time I put this thing on, you know, I mean, I know that's the same with all the, you know, shields. But it always makes me think of a sandwich, especially because this is like a three-layer one. Okay, all the pins are there. Where is my USB? Okay. Well, it didn't blow. It didn't blow up. Oh, there's a picture. Okay, it's flickering on the camera, but it looks fine in real life. Okay. I think it's time that we try this. So let's plug in. So I've got the IEC cable plugged in to the 128. And uh, I do have a longer cable on the way. It's just taking forever to get here. So, because I quickly realized that this is going to be a problem. So that's plugged in. So let's turn the 128 on. Okay. Uh, graphics. I'm not gonna lie, by having my 128 seemingly die right then and there put a serious pit in my stomach. However, I'll let past me explain what happened. Okay, you might see that we now have the uh, picture back. Uh, the problem was a little bit more complicated than I'd like, so let me turn the Commodore off. So the 128 has two video outputs. It has the 40 column cable here and the 80 column, which I plugged in to, um, so we could test CPM. Um, and I'm using a retro tank here to upscale, uh, to, well, to convert to HDMI so I could use the LCD, just because I find filming with the CRT quite difficult. And what was happening is that I'm using I am using a cheater cable, which is, or a pin seven cable, which lets you do 80 columns to a monochrome NTSC signal. And uh, apparently the retro tank gets really unhappy when you have multiple inputs at once. So as long as I only have the one input, because I'm using S-Video for the 128, uh, it's fine. If I only have the 80 columns cable, it's fine. Yes, our first failure was entirely unrelated to the Pi 1541. It wouldn't be the only one. So here, does it turn on? Okay, yep. So there we are at the Commodore basic screen. But it's hung. Let me uh, run. Yeah. I was curious if that was going to happen. So a Commodore 128 will try an auto boot. And it looks like that's exactly what it tried to do and failed. So 
If I hold down the Commodore key when I turn the system on, it should go, yeah, it goes into 64 mode. I should now be able to send commands. So I'm not completely sure what's happening. Once again, I start to debug this until I realize that the problem was literally staring me in the face. I should be getting some video. Oh, well, you know, that would be the problem. I just, I spotted the problem. I forgot to put the micro SD card back in. That would do it. Note to self, make sure brain is engaged before attempting this. Okay, so let's plug that in. So if I hit F3, I get directory, I get pi 5141B, that's all correct. I was dead tired when I finally got success, but this was gratifying to say the least. Victory was mine. There was of course the ultimate test to tell me if it was really working. It's an 8-bit dance party. At this point, it was time to see if all this effort into running Magic Desk was indeed worthwhile. As it turns out, and let's get a drum roll please. The answer is yes, Magic Desk does appear to work. At this point, I could have called it good and just gone back to video production, but past me decided to get ambitious. Present me is wishing he didn't. Past me decided to run a few basic tests, such as running 128 specific software via the boot command. At first, things went well, but given the title of this video, you should all be unsurprised that I started running into issues. For instance, Superscript 128 started perfectly fine, albeit with a 3 minute load time, since I wasn't using a fast loader. That's to be expected since the Pi 5141 is supposed to be an accurate emulator and well, we'll get to that in a moment. However, it didn't take me too long to find that, much to my surprise, the Pi 1541 does not support D71 images, nor does it support 1571 emulation. That's surprising because the Pi 1541, despite the name, can also emulate a Commodore 1581 disk drive, albeit without burst mode support. That previous sentence was probably meaningless to most of my viewers. I have found that the easiest way to understand the difference between Commodore disk drives is with use of an analogy. In that vein, the 1541 can best be compared to the American rail system. This might seem strange, but if you think about it, it quickly becomes clear that they both exist, they both move things from point to point, and yet both match to be a disappointment from start to finish without extensive work. To quantify that, due to multiple design flaws, the 1541, without modification, has a data transfer rate of approximately 400 bytes per second. That means it takes two to three seconds to load one kilobyte of data, and thus the abysmally long load times that Commodore machines are known for. This led to an entire cottage industry of fast loaders that attempted to solve the problem, none of which Commodore adopted or endorsed. Instead, in true Commodore fashion, they released a successor, the 1571, which utterly failed to fix the problem. To continue the analogy from earlier, the 1571 is just like high-speed rail in the United States. Both command an unusually high price, and the high-speed aspect exists in a more theoretical than practical sense, but both Commodore and the US federal government can at least say an effort was made. In theory, the 1571 was capable of faster performance through a method known as burst mode. In burst mode operation, the 1571 had a throughput of nearly 5 kilobytes per second or nearly 10 times the speed of the 1541. Using the VICE emulator, I can show CPM loading in real time without a cut from a 1571. Doing the same without burst mode takes, on average, a bit more than a minute. However, burst mode was never officially supported on the Commodore 64 or on the Commodore 128's C64 mode. 
it was only supported on the C128 in native mode or when running CPM. While there were some modest reasons for a user to upgrade, namely support for double density disks, the main selling point of the 1571 was entirely mooted. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, the Pi 1541 does not support burst mode at all. As I previously mentioned, there's also no support for 1571 disk images. However, these problems are due to software limitations and the Pi 1541 offer has stated their intent to implement both in the future. Hopefully, these things will be fixed soon, especially since burst mode will really help make the last drive on our list, the 1581, really shine. The best comparison I could make is that once in a lifetime experience of seeing an on-time New Jersey Transit train. It's something that's known to exist, and there's documented evidence of such things, but one would have to be exceptionally lucky to experience it in the wild. The 1581, however, has developed a somewhat unusual niche in the preservation era due to its high capacity. Due to the prevalence of disk emulators, D81 game conversions have become somewhat common to help reduce or eliminate disk swapping. Just as a test, I did confirm that a D81 version of RISC loaded without issues in C64 mode. However, my personal interest in the 1581 is a bit different and can be summarized as GEOS 128 and CPM. GEOS, which was an early graphical operating system, is one of the few things that can take full advantage of the Commodore 128's native mode and something I want to dedicate an entire video for. Although it was very slow without a fast loader, GEOS 128 did load successfully and did appear to work without issue. CPM, however, was a somewhat different story. Any attempt to start CPM from the Pi 1541 from a D81 image resulted in a system hang. I did confirm that my image was good by testing it in Vice, so this is definitely a Pi problem. I had reason to suspect that this might be a problem with how the Pi loads the CPM boot sector. In truth, I wasn't content to give up here, and I was curious if it was possible to at least use the Pi 1541 as a data disk. Since the SD2 IDC can start CPM, I changed the Pi to drive letter 9 and hooked it up to the IEC daisy chain and then attempted to boot again. With the SD2 IDC in place, I did manage to get a little further, but it would hang at the booting CPM Plus screen. It appears at first glance that the Pi 1541 might be incompatible with CPM, but the truth is a little more nuanced. If I left the Pi in 1541 emulation mode, CPM would start up and I could even format disks. That seemed to suggest the incompatibility is with the 1581 emulation specifically. I should have stopped here with my answer, but curiosity, unfortunately, got the better of me. I had a strange urge to answer a question that really didn't need to be answered and probably shouldn't have been answered, and that's namely to see if you can in fact start CPM on a Commodore 128 from a 1541 desk. This is a hard idea for a multitude of reasons, and as far as I know, it's also not something that has ever been supported by Commodore. Still, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I guess. It's not hard to make a CPM boot disk, it's mostly just a matter of transferring the right files with the pip command. My SD2 IDC is modified to support burst mode, but this was still a painfully slow process that took ages to complete. After copying what I thought were all the essential files, I moved the Pi 1541 back to drive number 8 and gave it a go. Surprisingly, the system actually did start to boot. Two minutes later, I learned that I had come surprisingly close to success, with the only issue being that I forgot ccp.com. One pip command later, and well, Yes, you can start CPM from a 1541 disk drive, but you really, really shouldn't though. Not if you value your sanity anyway. Hopefully, I'll never have to do this again unless I end up with a Commodore 64 CPM cartridge. The C64 CPM cart is one of the worst products to ever be developed, and I'm slightly scared for my sanity if it should ever cross my path. Before I dwell any deeper on that, let's get back to the topic at hand. 
I added my observations to the GitHub bug on this topic. With luck, this will be relatively straightforward to fix. With a fast loader, there are some interesting CPM projects I can do with both the SD to IDC and the Pi 1541 working in tandem. With that, it's time for my final thoughts. From what I can tell, the Pi 1541 is great if you have a Commodore 64 and wish accurate 1541 emulation. I'll certainly be getting a lot of use out of it for that alone. However, if you want to use it with a Commodore 128, be advised that without a fast loader, for the moment, the performance is going to suck. Furthermore, without D71 support, at least some 128 software cannot be loaded. Even with these caveats, I still recommend the Pi 1541 to any Commodore lover. One final note before I close is that the Piazzo speaker on my Pi 1541 doesn't seem to work. I have fiddled with the options, but with no success. I may have installed it backwards, but beyond that, everything seems to work. Ideas about the speaker are welcome below, and just so I don't get a million comments about it, I will try and strain the LCD connector. With that said, if you really enjoyed this content, it would mean a lot to me if you liked and subscribed. If you really enjoyed this content, consider hitting that bell or supporting me on Patreon. As usual, you can follow my adventures in real time on Twitter or come chat on Discord. This is N Commander signing off and wishing you all a pleasant day.